Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to get started. We got a, a lot to cover, a lot of ground to cover here and I'm excited to have a, uh, uh, a really esteemed panel of managers of transit systems, small urban operations that are in and around university uh, communities to talk about uh, this. Uh, uh, you know, when we started the Sun Network, um, the, the real group, the cadre of managers who we were working with, uh, uh, David Bruffy on the panel being one, most of them were serving university communities. And, and between that and the stick program, that's always been a critical legislative goal for CTA because of that. Um, yeah, the, 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 we've always wanted to kind of have this session and to really dive a little deeper into universities and um, uh, uh, you know kind of the relationships. Um, we get a lot of cities that approach CTAA that oftentimes are city officials in university communities that are trying to make sense of um, how they work with transit uh, and and it is a critical partnership is, 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 is really my long-winded way of getting to that. So, uh, and by having um, breakout sessions within the, um, it, within the sun and, and being virtual allows us to do that, uh, this is great. And, it's a, and a, it's, a, it's a perfect time to kind of tackle this. So um, I appreciate it. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, and the keep moving my slides forward. We just did that. Everybody has been muted on the way in, but we're a small enough group here. We're gonna be in the mid twenties. Maybe we'll end up with around 30. We're small enough that um, at some point I'll turn off this and we will just go directly to um, everybody appearing uh, Brady Bunch style. And what I'll ask you to do is if you have a comment you wanna make, you have something that you wanna interject, in the chat box, just put your name and I'll call on you and then you can unmute, fire away, put yourself back on mute. We're, we're going to be careful with that just because we don't want um, uh, uh, bad audio or people talking over each other, which can sometimes happen. So that's, that's the reason if we seem a little, a, a, a little crazy about that, that, that is the reason for that. Um, uh, nothing more. So let me introduce the, the four panelists who were just so happy agreed to kind of be our session leaders here. And I'll do very brief introductions uh, and bios uh, of each, um, but, but rest assured that these are folks that are running systems that work directly uh, with universities. And so, you know, in all different ways too. So we'll start off with Barbara. I met I think really I met Barbara for the first time at the four state kind of SWATA region seven, is that region seven? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, meeting last fall in KC. And she was uh, uh, on pins and needles, had gone through hopefully being selected as the director of transit. And I was so happy when I saw that she had indeed been selected. Uh, so, so Barbara started as the GM or the transit director at SciRide in Ames, Iowa, where uh, Ames is host to a uh, home to Iowa State University um, in October. So, uh, uh, you know, it's one of those be careful what you wish for scenarios mm -hmm. like, hey, hey, we're going to have you really get to direct this transit system. And oh, by the way, one of the most major calamities to befall transit is about to happen. Have fun. Um, but that is, she's been in trance for 25 years, held numerous positions at SciRide, so has a lot of, of experience to share with everybody here today. Uh, Sean McBride is the executive director at Metro in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He's been there since uh, uh, 2012. And Sean kind of has an interesting background, being more from planning and, and city leadership uh, prior to transit. Do I have that right, Sean? and worked in Tucson and Portage, Michigan, Highland Park, Illinois, Phoenix, Arizona. So kind of a good broad based approach to, to, to city leadership, which obviously is gonna impact how he works in the transit field. 
Uh, David Bruffy uh, is the CEO at the Mountain Lion Transit Authority in Morgantown, West Virginia. Oh, I forgot to mention Sean's agency, obviously Western Michigan University is, is located in Kalamazoo. For David, it's WV, WVU, West Virginia University. Um, he has been in that role for 23 years and uh, has also had numerous leadership positions at the West Virginia Public Transit Association. He has uh, really uh, been a leader at CTA in so many different ways, somebody that we count on and talk to quite a bit when we're vetting issues and legislation. And, you know, I, I would use David as a really good indication for everybody here to know that engage with us and, and, and we'll, you'll get a lot out of your membership, your relationship with CTAA, the more you engage. And David is, has done that in, in exactly the right way. And last, but certainly not least, Taylor Johnson is the public transit coordinator for the city of Norman, Norman, Oklahoma, uh, home of OU, of which he is a graduate of OU. Uh, and, and he has transit experience in planning, civil rights, grants management, and reporting. So again, like Barbara, um, a lot, a vast experience in, in the business. So welcome to all of the panelists. We are gonna hold this session in, in a, in a discussion-based format. And again, because of that, I would encourage you to uh, hit, hit us up on the chat box. If you wanna add something in, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, as we go through some some issues and uh, let's kind of keep this conversational and make sure that you get out of this session uh, what you have come to spend time on. So before we start, we'll go right down the line as I'm looking at the video. I'm going to ask each of our presenters just to give us a sense of the size of their system and also the percentage of students that are their ridership because that gives us an indication, I think, of how much they are uh, work, the, the partnership with the local university, how critical it is. So Barbara, would you mind uh, leading off with that? Sure, so um, like Scott said, I work for SciRide. It's the city bus system in Ames, Iowa. Ames is home of Iowa State University. The population of Ames is about 60,000 with about half of them being Iowa State students. SciRide is a little unique. It's a collaboration between the city of Ames, Iowa State University, and the student government. So they are three funding, local funding partners. They fund about 70% of our operating budget. Um, we have 87 large vehicles, combination of 40 and 60 foot, um, eight minibuses. About 93% of our riders are ISU students. Um, and each student that rides SciRide, or each student that comes to Iowa State generates about 165 rides on SciRide. So last year we carried about, it's a population of Ames of about 60,000. We carried about 6.1 million passengers last year. And so student percentage, at roughly half, three quarters? So of the town, about half the town is ISU students, but about 93% of our riders are Iowa State students. Okay. So, and and if you were in the previous session where I was discussing, if you are serving in a university and you need to be looking at the stick program, Ames's SciRide is a perfect example, five stick factors, which is a significant part of your budget. Correct. Um, we got more, our stick money was more than our um, appropriation this year. So yes. Yeah. Uh, and stick, for those of you who aren't totally in the loop on that, is really the, the, the only performance-based metric that, that directly relates to funding in the federal transit program. And, 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 and in this case, there are six factors, and, and we'll talk more about this later, but each of those factors can be anywhere from about 150 on the low end to 200 plus thousand, and we think, uh, uh, once we get the um, once we get the new uh, uh, reauthorization of the FAST Act, we think we're going to be able to bump that pot up to three percent of the total 5307. So it's it's my hope that we can start to get a factor even up 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 north of 300,000 for a factor to to really reward high performance. So um, uh, Sean, tell us about your agency and kind of how you fit. Yeah, the city, the, the metro serves Kalamazoo County, 
It's about 230,000 residents uh, countywide. We provide about 3 million rides annually on all our service products. Um, our ridership with Western Michigan University is about 20% of our overall ridership. Okay. Uh, our relationship's changing. Uh, previously, we just provided connections to campus. Uh, and this upcoming year, we're changing the model that we also provide uh, on-campus uh, busing service. So, ah, well, we'll want to get into that. That's an interesting um, transition for you. That is an interesting transition, and uh, uh, yeah, what, what better we'll time to try that, we'll right, that than right when we have a virus? That uh, right? I mean, uh, you're 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 a glutton for punishment, Sean. Uh, right. <laughs> Thank and you. so we have about uh, 20 routes, uh, system, system wide, uh, $19 million budget. Sean's system is one of the largest that's a CTA member. You heard that population he mentioned. That's a critical line. That 200,000 line makes all the difference. We're going to talk about the impact of the census here shortly on, on, on kind of what we're all looking at. But, but just as an example, being at 230 pop, Sean's system and, and Kalamazoo Cal Metro is a little too big to be in for the stick program as, as one outcome of that. Uh, how about you, Taylor? Talk about um, your work and, 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 and Norman and, and, and OU. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'll report on the, the ridership for the city of Norman transit system. Um, I, I could dive into uh, more of our relationship with OU, but we'll wait for that. Uh, a little over a year ago, I'd have a lot more ridership to give you, but um, the university decided not to operate city transit, and uh, the city of Norman uh, took over the city routes as of July 1 of 2019, and the university opted to keep running campus routes. So uh, as of today, we, the city of Norman is uh, a, quite a bit smaller than the other agencies. We have 26 vehicles. Um, we have seven routes. We're just at 300,000 uh, annual ridership and with 40% of that being students on the city routes. Okay, okay. Uh, and city of Norman, uh, like, like the others, it's 120,000, um, give or take, population. Okay, and, and we'll, we'll get into kind of, uh, we're going to talk about kind of relationships with the university because you are going through clearly a transition period that we'll want to we'll want to talk about because I think some of the other folks in the audience may be in similar positions. Yep, the university operated the system for 30 years and um, uh, citywide, campus and city, and so uh, we we took it over in about 12 to 18 months, depending on whenever <laughs> whenever you want to count from. So it's interesting. But thanks. And and for for those in the audience, that's one of those things when people say it's interesting that is like when your CFO comes and says some of the numbers in your budget are interesting, it's probably not good. Yeah, uh, thanks Taylor. David, talk about uh, Morgantown, Mountain Line and WVU. Um, Mountain Line was started in 1996, we're a fairly new system. When we were put together, it was a city and county system that was consolidated and the county commission and city council actually set aside a seat for our university president to appoint to. So I have a seven member board and one of those members is a university appointee. As a part of that process, what, um, what we started to do was to provide service for the university and the late night service that they didn't want. And that board member was critical in bringing that service to our doorstep. We're about six and a half million dollar budget. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were just under a million rides. We've been as high as 1.3. We saw that degrade degradation of ridership uh, that everyone's yes. seen in the last few years. We have uh, 24 local routes, one inner city route. Um, we have about, um, we have 35 revenue vehicles and we have, we should have about 70 employees. We're short in drivers. So that's a, one of the challenges for us as it is for many other people. Yep. And David, you have something also that is, is makes you guys an outlier is you've got this 1960s version of personal rapid transit that is an autonomous uh, <laughs> rail system uh, that is fairly unique. Uh, but talk about how that kind of impacts what you do. 
Well, um, it was known as the personal rapid transit system. It was developed under UNTA. It had 100 cars on an elevated rail. They did about two and a half million rides a year. Um, they're very small cars, so now I guess you would have to call it the CRT, the COVID can't ride RT. Um, no decision's been made yet about those two and a half million rides. WVU is divided up into three primary campuses. So between bus service and the PRT, you're looking at over three million rides a year that right now, as WVU decides to come back in whatever form they're still formulating, um, we're curious how we're going to get all those folks around, especially with our climate when it's January and it's zero and there's snow and there's ice. I'm not sure how that's going to work. And a couple of hills too. Yeah, one or two. Yeah, yeah, just a couple of those. So, so that gives you a sense of kind of the 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 breadth of how our presenters work with their universities. I'm going to take the screen off of my sh off of my sharing of this slide so we can kind of all see each other and I can see everyone who's participating here. Um, first, first thing I, I think we need to all talk about is, um, is, is clearly what's happening this fall. It's the, the elephant in the corner of the room. Um, so why don't you start, Sean, what's going on with Western Michigan University in the fall and, and how is that impacting your thinking right now? And let me even start a little bit before that. We started probably a year and a half ago talking with our contacts at Western on transitioning to doing the on-campus service. Um, they were seeing significant budget reductions with uh, some steady declining enrollment uh, here, in, here in Kalamazoo. So they were looking at how to run a more efficient transit system and uh, partnered with us to make that happen. So we're, we're kind of towards the final ends of planning that and uh, approving contracts and then COVID hit and no one knows what the heck's going on um, and where the world's going. So that just kind of stalled until, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago and we're like, well, <laughs> we better get going on figuring this fall out if we're going to uh, take on the on-campus service. Yeah. Um, so Western is going to come back with uh, uh, students on campus, uh, from what I understand, those they're going to run remote classes for those that can be remote and the uh, more science classes and lab classes and so forth will be in person. Uh, they, probably like a lot of you, they have a, we have a large foreign student population. They really have no idea what that's going to look like in the fall. Uh, those are a lot of the, a lot of the engineering campuses. Uh, foreign students, and that's that's kind of across town. So that's one of the key connections. Uh, they don't, they haven't told me what dorms are going to look like at this point, and where uh, how they're going to be structured. So we'll we'll be figuring that out on the fly. And uh, we're we're running buses at about fifty to sixty uh, fifty to sixty percent of capacity. Uh, we're rear door boarding still at this point. So still operating fareless? Correct. Yeah. That's about a $250,000 uh, a month loss. Uh, the CARES funds that we received are covering that at this point. Um, and we're, we're, we haven't set a transition date on that. Uh, we've seen a little uptick here lately in Kalamazoo and, and don't want to, we, we have a very secure barricade between the drivers and the passengers at this point that's making everyone pretty comfortable. We don't want to remove that and uh, impact our driver population any more than it, than it, than it is at this point. Uh, like probably most of you, we are having driver uh, shortage of drivers at this point and with increased service. Uh, that's probably one of the things we'll talk about later that's going to keep me up at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I can, you, it, it, you're, you're, it, it's really interesting to be trying to initiate this right at, at the time when this hits. But, you know, in some ways, it's really gonna give you the opportunity to be flexible. And if you can meet the university's kind of needs, it's really gonna give you the opportunity to cement yourselves as, a, as an important partner too, right? Correct, and we've had this relationship since 1998. And I think that 
the relationship that I have, my staff have with their counterparts at Western, and uh, actually my board president uh, was a former vice president in, at Western Michigan University, which always helps uh, helps things a little bit along the way. Um, so when we, we, we usually have a longer contract, a five-year contract. We entered in just, just a one-year contract for this upcoming year, knowing that we both don't, don't know what the year is going to look like. Yeah. And we wrote in the contract uh, a, a lot of flexibility for both parties to change um, how we operate and have flexibility as we move forward because we don't really know what the environment's going to be. Like. Thanks. Thanks. How about you, Taylor? What, what, what are you looking at in, in Norman in terms of the fall, uh, which is, you know, a couple of weeks away for a lot of these campuses? Yeah, it's, uh, it's my understanding that OU is transitioning as many of the large classes to online and then they're moving those kind of second tier classes into the bigger rooms and the third tier classes into those slightly bigger rooms so they can space people out. I believe it's the plan right now to have uh, people on campus. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I wrote down here in my notes, we're just kind of living day by day like everybody else. Who I could, You could probably ask me that next week and OU is probably going to say something different. So, we're not really sure, um, and we're, but we are preparing for more riders on the, the city side just because some students and faculty and staff will need to be getting to and from campus. So we are looking at increasing capacity on the, on the vehicles. Right now we're doing, um, at the beginning of this, we taped off the amount of seats that we had to to keep the six feet social distancing, and we, um, that's like 10 to 12 people per bus. So we're thinking about increasing that in the next coming weeks in preparation for that. But um, that's kind of the quick and dirty, uh, not sure, living day by day. Yeah, no. Barbara, what, what's, what, what's, it, what's the look in Ames right now? Well, um, so first I should part, kind of start by saying, so Iowa is just a handful of states that never enacted a stay-at-home order. They kind of feel like since Iowa is sparse and rural that COVID wouldn't really surge at all. So um, we're fortunate that we have been actively involved with the university, but they are coming back fully actually in um, August 17th. So returning to learn, um, they're starting a week earlier. They will be ending classes the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So they'll be off the Wednesday before Thanksgiving all the way through January 11th. Um, many of the classes like Taylor just mentioned um, will be kind of a hybrid of in-person, online, um, big classes will be online, um, smaller tier classes will be in those bigger classrooms. Um, so those are kind of the things affecting SciRide, I guess, but they're also taking additional measures. So people have been moving in for the last week. Um, every student living in the campus housing has to be tested for COVID. So they're testing them right now. I was on a partner meeting this morning and um, they won't give us the numbers to let us know who's been testing positive, but of the people who have tested positive, 80%, so they have an isolation place for them, 80% have chosen to go home. So that's kind of nice, I guess. They're not here in Ames, but um, uh, I can talk more about it, but we have a really good relationship with the university. I think it was David that mentioned he has a student member on his board. So I'm also governed by a board. I actually have um, two students on my board, plus a permanent um, faculty person at Iowa State University. So we've been really involved in their campaigning to mask and being required on campus, things like that. That's critical right now, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the ability to work in sync especially with the percentage of ridership coming from students uh, uh, and for you to be seen by the leadership of the university as kind of their transit arm is, right. is so important. I should say we are not, we don't have the ability, which I'm sure many people listening don't, to um, socially distance on the bus. So we are not socially distancing at all. We started doing that, but starting July 15th, we are back to, um, what I would say is our normal service levels. Obviously students aren't riding yet, yeah. but we are not planning on socially distancing. We've done a little um, aerodynamic thing. We have aerospace engineer on staff to try to get the university comfortable with the airflow on the bus. And then we're gonna limit as much as we possibly can people's time on the bus to less than 15 minutes based on that CDC guidance. Yeah, yeah. I, many of the folks that are participating in this conference are in that same boat where uh, uh, the, the, 
the, whether it's their essential ridership or it's just their returning ridership, six foot social distance gets overwhelmed and there's simply not enough vehicles to meet that capacity. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a crunch. Uh, David, what about it uh, in Morgantown? Uh, wh what, are, what are they thinking there? Well, um, the, the story's changed as we've gone along. So when we started in July, all the students were gonna come back. We were gonna go full bore. Um, now it's rolled back. They've uh, set our start date back a week. I think maybe they're watching Ames to see how fast your town catches on fire. That gives us a two week head start. Um, and then um, now I'm hearing, and I haven't seen this direct information, but there's conversation about, well, we're only gonna bring seniors back or we're only gonna bring freshmen back. Our goal through all of this, our ridership's down 54%, uh, but over the, we didn't cut back service at all. We uh, were providing essential services. And when I would watch people at the transfer hub to see who was riding, they were wearing scrubs. They were wearing fast food outfits. They were wearing grocery store. So, you know, it, it was the kind of situation where we didn't want to reduce service, even though we didn't have a lot of people on the bus. We are requiring face coverings. We are requiring socially dis social distancing. We're opening the vents in the bus to try and create air circulation. We're doing all the things that, that we possibly can. And I expect there to be overcrowding. Um, I don't think that we're going to change that model. I don't think that there's really anything that we as a transit system can do to make up for the the challenge that everyone faces it's going to have to be an understanding on everybody's part there i know the university is trying to schedule courses core curriculum courses so there has to be less movement between campuses uh, but still the the uh, the challenge i think is going to be the social responsibility of the students when they come back and from my college experience that's really where i learned social responsibility so i don't know how well that's gonna, well, I have a good guess, but I'm dreading it, really. Yes, I, my, my daughter is a junior, soon to be junior at James Madison down in Harrisonburg. Uh, I'm not sure they're, they've joined, they're, they're part of these, these sessions, uh, Harrisonburg Transit. And um, yes, yeah, social responsibility and 20 year olds do not always, um, do not always add up. And- uh, Party school, no. No, and my wife and I live in fear that they're not going to have class, so she's going to be home for another four months. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know who fears that worse, my daughter or my wife and I, but, but you know, I think a lot of universities are doing what, what's happening at Iowa State, like kind of having one, one direct uh, 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 point of time and, and, and then calling out a semester and not having people go home for Thanksgiving and then come back uh, 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 because of the, the dangers. But, you know, the, the, um, do, any, do, do either, any of you in, uh, on the panel worry about, and, and, I, and this is probably really a rhetorical question because I think you, you probably all, we all worry about this. What happens if you've got to have these crowds or your buses start to crowd more than even you're comfortable with, and then there's a breakout, uh, uh, and someone through contact tracing or something looks at at, at your operations. Do, is that something that you've even planned for? Yeah, we we have. Yeah. Um, we've actually asked um, our passengers to register their rides so that if we do contact contact tracing, we have. Uh, at least a fighting chance. So we have the video, we have the digital passes that we can track them with, we have the same for students. So through our fare system, we can see where those people are. And I, I do, you know, we went through this early, so we saw what the problem was. And at the same time, I'm concerned about what happens when we have that outbreak. If it hits my workforce, we're gonna have to roll back service. And so I spent a lot of time working on a plan to roll that back and try to assure that we weren't going to create um, transportation deserts. Anybody else on the panel kind of have any thoughts on that topic of, of uh, contingency planning, kind of like what happens if? I think that speaks volumes and it, that, that, that 
uh, uh, as we talked about at the outset of this session, uh, it is day by day. And it is uh, a lot of what we're doing is trying to figure out um, uh, what the landscape looks like today. And a week from now, it may look completely different. And when you're working in these settings too, in, in, in the university settings, um, I think it's even more so. For, for the panelists, and I'll, and I'll start with you, Sean, is there any work you've done, particularly uh, uh, off-campus housing? So there's, there's transportation of students, for those of you who are doing it on campus, but how much of off-campus housing, off-campus work is, is, is a big part of, of your operation in Kalamazoo? So, so that's what, all we did before was right. until this year was off campus and connecting into the university. So uh, our system is designed to hit those neighborhoods and those apartment complexes in particular, and then also connect the campus to those shopping corridors that the students want to get to. So we're set up pretty well that way. And from the uni university's perspective, they really see that as a benefit to their recruitment. Uh, uh, that all students have unlimited ridership on the system. Um, all faculty and staff have ri unlimited ridership on the system. So we're really inter interconnected, the transit system and the university. Yeah, I mean, it's just so much of city leadership and, and Taylor, you've been dealing directly with Norman city leadership from your, your perspective. I would assume that's a pretty significant role that the bus system is going to be playing is that off campus to campus piece. Yeah, and uh, we're still using the transfer hub on campus. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, this is a little bit uh, down the line of questions, but we're actually started, uh, we had a contract approved a few weeks ago with a consultant to go through a long range planning process uh, for the city of Norman transit service. And obviously we're looking at how to connect with uh, the university, but in all likelihood, um, we'll probably be looking at another location for a transfer hub, and it'll probably be more traditionally downtown. And, you know, those are one of the big questions I have in my mind is, is that the smartest thing to do is to move that further away from the university, even though we're trying to become more of a city service, but that's a, a major demand, uh, like all, for all of us, the university is a major uh, push and pull factor for our systems, so. You seen that, Barbara, too? Um. Yeah, I mean, our service is really heavily connected to the university. Pretty much every single route operates from um, out in the community and then flows through central campus, you know. So um, we have to run a lot of trippers to hold the handle capacity from those outlying apartment complexes. We have a car, apart, we're fortunate having apartment complexes contact us about bus stops, how can they get amenities, can they do things like that, so that's nice. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, so we, we did a system redesign, and I know this will possibly come up later too, but we used to go through the actual core of central campus. We did in um, a year ago, about a year and a half ago, we only kind of go on the outside of central campus, so that has um, had our ridership decrease a little. But I mean, we really heavily focused on connecting into the university. Sure, sure. And, and I think that's, a, that's a, a key piece, you know, these, these the, we're so used to in transit this concept of like uh, that you read about you know the mall that says I we want to get rid of the bus stop but in a lot of university communities they want the bus stop they want service have you been able any of you been able to get off-campus housing apartment complexes and such to help subsidize or support your service yeah we've done that for decades um, we have uh, right now we have one active off-campus private housing complex they team with another that was one of our objectives we've had four or five of those major complexes over the over the course of the years and what kind of revenue does that generate for you David when, when it's working well our contract with the university um, is a tiered system. So the more student swipes we have, the higher their contract is. We use the amount that they pay because it's their students living there to help buy down the cost to that private sector. So for a typical contract, they're probably paying 
half of the fully allocated costs. So, you know, an apartment complex run is going to be $150,000, $160,000 a year. And the other advantage of that, um, particularly when we first started, is that those complexes were built out where land was less expensive. So that meant that we could put service in between that complex and the university. So it helped our entire community. We always insisted and demanded that it be open door service that it be available to the public. So in that way, we could create additional service and it helped keep that town gown balance where we weren't just benefiting university students or just local residents. How, how have you all worked with, um, uh, I, I was in Columbia, Missouri, happened to be there for meetings uh, with Missouri Public Transit Association. That's home to another Big 12 school, Mizzou, and immediately, the day I, st I got there was the day that, I think it was Lime dropped what seemed to be thousands of uh, bikes all over campus, and it was, it was insanity. It, you know, it just, my question is, have you seen any influxes in your community areas of those other types of micro transit services and how, how, what's your plan to work with those kinds of things? Why don't you start, Taylor? Yeah, so uh, the university actually had our first bike share system in the community a few years ago, started operating, started operating it. Um, as of last year, they no longer do that. They just contract with, uh, I think it's called VO Ride or VO Ride um, to provide scooters and some, um, some bikes. And the, the city also allows them to come into the city. Uh, after we got over the wave of Lime scooters and Bird scooters, and they kind of went away, um, there was kind of a, a need that people wanted to be able to do these things. And so uh, we allowed those scooters and bikes to come off campus and into the city. So that's where we are right now. Um, we, we just have these VO ride um, scooters and, and bikes in our community. How about you, Sean? Have you seen that in Kalamazoo? There's been a lot of discussion on it. it. It hasn't materialized at this point that I can't say I'm overly disappointed about that. Um, we're, our transit hub downtown's like smack dab in the middle of a valley here. And well, they see that as kind of a detriment that any way to get anywhere that you're uh, biking uphill to uh, get out of the downtown. And yeah. Western Michigan University is located in a kind of a rolling hilly area. So. Okay, okay. David, you seen those here in your part of the part, part of the world? No, if we did, they'd all be down by the river, because um, everybody would rent them at the top of the hill, ride them down the hill. There's no way they're going to ride them back. Um, judging, judging from all the YouTube videos, when my daughter went to school and they all dropped there, they some of them would be in the river, but that's another uh, story. Yeah. Yeah, I expect um, I expect from bike sales and bike shop owners and what I've heard that we'll see a lot of bikes on campus um, and I expect the bike racks will be well used, but yeah. the top really is a challenge and so is the weather. You know, we're, we're in a uh, temperate, we, we've got winter, so yeah. a bike's not very fun. <laughs> and you, Barbara, has that, been a, has that been an issue in Ames? No, um, I, you know, again, we're pretty ingrained into the university. So students give us a lot of money. About $5.8 million of my budget comes from student fees. Wow. So actually have resisted having e-scooters and a lot of that stuff come to Ames. The city's not interested in that as well. I think they are more, since they pay so much for Cyride, they want to be able to utilize Cyride. So I, I think we're fortunate in respect to that. Yeah, no, and I mean, the setup of SciRide from its outset has really been to do this. So mm -hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense um, in, in terms of that. Do you, um, how often do you, particularly with, with, with your amount of work with the university, uh, Barbara, reach out to incoming freshmen's parents? Uh, uh, having been on the other end of that relatively recently, you know, to be able to say, no, take the bus, you don't need a car. Uh, the, the expense, the, the, the danger, all that being not something to worry about was, you know, my wife and I really liked. Is that something that you do with, with student groups and, and parent groups? 
Um, yeah, we do. So we have, they have a orientation that they do for new students. They send that out or a portal. Uh, this year it's a little different due to COVID, but um, they're um, showing a video about how to ride the bus, the importance of riding the bus. We allow the parents and the students that you typically come in June, they didn't this year, but we let them ride for free, see how easy it is to get around on the bus, things like that. I really think students paying a fee makes them want to use the service, you know, because they're already paying for it. So it comes out of their tuition anyway. So I um, again, I, we have a really good relationship with the university. I feel fortunate, um, especially after listening to some of the other people, not just the panelists, but other people, I think we're very fortunate with regards to that. Yeah, I think so too. How often do you meet and interact with university leadership? Well, I have, like I said, three on our board. So every board, every month, but as as COVID's kind of happened, we have weekly partner meetings with them. So we're part of their emergency EOC. So then we have a lot of conversations with regards to them about how to keep people safe. What are we doing? What are they seeing? They've been helpful in getting us PPE when it was difficult to get in the beginning. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's Cyride started in 1981, and it was really a decision by the university and the city to make us one agency. So it was collaborative then. So I think it's just always, it's kind of now that is, that's all that everybody knows is that's all it's ever been, you know? I mean, that, 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 that agreement right from the inception makes a big difference. Um, uh, you know, Sean in Kalamazoo, uh, uh, you're, you're hearing this in parts of where you want to get in terms of direct work with the university is, is what you're hearing from SciRide. H how do you see the burgeoning relationship that you're trying to build? Uh, if you had to say, hey, let's not, let's not talk COVID anymore. Let's just think in five years, you know, what would you want it to look like? You know, a couple of things. Certainly, I'd want increasing ridership and meet their own evolving campus needs. And you know, they're they're investing a lot in in capital on campus and redoing dorms and facilities on campus, trying to connect the community to campus more than they did. It was kind of an island uh, in the previous design. They're trying to interconnect more. So, I think they see us as part of that. I think there's an infrastructure piece uh, that. Uh, we and they need to look at uh, you know, a, a transit hub that is uh, pleasant and, and uh, inviting for the public to come onto campus and easy to figure out how to get around campus from that hub. And um, so those sorts, those sorts of things. And then it's, all, it's always in service delivery. We have to do a good job on, on doing the day to day and getting people there and efficiently, safely on time in a nice clean bus and uh, doing that every day and being consistent on that. Taylor, so, so you've kind of gone through uh, 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 the churn of all of this. And, and I think from our previous discussions, one of the things you're trying to do in Norman is reestablish the, the right relationship and balance between the city and the university. Same question to you as Sean, if, if, you could, if you could map it out and it all went according to plan, what is the plan? You know, where would you like it to end up? Yeah, um, you know, we, since we took this over less, or about a year ago, um, we haven't got to have many conversations because we were just getting our feet under Neath us, and then COVID happened, and the university shut down completely, and all these different things. But I would really like the city and the university systems to uh, work together. As of right now, um, the system really didn't change. So we have campus routes, we have city routes, but we already did that. It's just not operated by one system; it's operated by two. So there's still the same connections and everything. Yeah. But um, I just hope that the system comes together. Uh, well that the the riders either if they're students or public um, whether they're riding each one that they can you know transfer between the two and um, yeah I that's what I would love to hear I mean I don't want to in the past it was uh, university you you do transit that's that's your thing and good good job good luck and now I, I don't want it to swing to the city where they're saying yeah city you do you do transit um, good job good luck we'll stay out of it I want I want it to be collaborative so yeah, yeah, like in all things, it's that balance we're looking for here that I think allows these systems to thrive. Yeah, 
Yeah, David, you have any, uh, uh, you know, you've got a good working relationship with the university. I like the swipes and, and the way you guys kind of measure and we've talked about it in that the past, but, but how'd you like to see things improve? You know, where would you like to take these things? Well, I think a, a big part of the reason we have that good relationship is that um, my board member who is a university appointee, he's the director of parking and transportation for the university who I negotiate our contract with every year. So the, the transparency part of that makes the university comfortable to say to us when they were looking at uh, trying to deal with bringing the students back, they're like, how many more buses and how, many much, how much more service can you put in place? And I was able to be honest and say, without drivers, we can't do anything. Um, we're not gonna be able to help. It's not that we don't want to, but we're not gonna be able to. So I, I think that the university service has helped us build, they're less than 20% of our revenue at this point. They've helped us, helped us build the service over the years. They're a really uh, critical component of the entire community. So I wanna see the maintenance of that service continue. And as they take on new facilities, as they expand their footprint, as they open up new, um, they opened up a new aquatic center that was on that some of that less expensive land that's considerably away from the downtown campus. We were able to start a new route with them. We have this ongoing dialogue and uh, they're actually sometimes they'll even give us a month's head notice before they want us to start a new service for them now. So, yeah. It, it, it is amazing. These universities, there's this massive infrastructure competition among them and they're all building up new facilities and dorms. But the one thing they they, in talking to a number of them, they don't want to build parking. That is not where they want to be expending their capital resources. They want aquatic centers and dorms and the things that attract students. Is that something that you, any of you have used to kind of um, talk about the importance of a bus system is the reduction of parking facilities? They know it's important um, we, when I, I worked at the city of Morgantown and at that point there were about 6,000 parking places on a campus that had 25,000 students plus faculty and staff and the city started to implement parking districts in neighborhoods. The university came to the table um, and since that time there, there are about 10,000 spaces now but they know that parking is and trans, traffic in general is an issue for them and they wanted, they haven't wanted the expense of transit because they would have issues making it public service and getting federal funds for it. So I think for them, it's not just about the operating costs, but it's about the sinking costs, the capital funds that they would have to put into a transit system. And, and the university already has one challenging transportation system that costs a lot of money to operate. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else kind of have anything to add to that? At Western, they're, they've designed their whole campus around parking, you know, back when they did it. Um, it's the last three or four years that they're really looking to do a campus redesign and make it pedestrian, bike, public transit friendly. So as they're doing facilities, it's, it's refreshing to see that they're, yeah. th that's moved up as a priority. Yeah, it, it is. And, and, and it, there's a planning component to all this. And, you know, I know Taylor, you were involved in the planning side of this, just like, uh, like David just mentioned, you know, putting the new aquatic facility out away from everything where the land's cheaper has other issues when it comes to transportation. Are you seeing that at OU? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true for anything, you know, well, well that land's cheap out there. We'll just build that and they'll just, They'll figure it out. Oh, can you run a bus out there? Yeah, that, that should be pretty easy. But, um, you know, OU is really concentrated on their core campus or the Health Science Center in Oklahoma City, which uh, we don't really serve. But um, there isn't a ton of, uh, I would say, expansion off of off of campus. It's already kind of a, a larger campus and land area, and they own a lot of empty land, so they're able to uh, able to build upon that footprint that they're already existing. So. Well, somebody raised it in, in kind of passing, and I think we ought to focus on a little bit, service redesign. And, and, and 
and plans that the four of you may have, you know, we, we in my last session, we kind of mentioned that a lot of people had plans kind of pre-COVID and now we're in the middle of it and it's changed some of those things. But I'm really curious, um, not discounting, but let's kind of put again the COVID issue aside. What are uh, and what have you done at your agencies to look at service redesigns based on serving a university? And what's kind of unique about that from maybe other small urbans that are not in university settings? Um, you know, uh, I can think of uh, uh, obvious pieces like, like, like student bodies are much more likely to use technology to want to do everything on their phone. Uh, from scheduling. So, so how have you been looking at, at service redesigns? And, and, and maybe Barbara, if, if I could ask you, could you kind of take, take the lead on that one? Sure. So I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but we did our first system redesign in 2018. It was known as SciRide 2.0. It was to take, um, it was actually to help with all those tripper buses because we were running about half of our fleet was extra buses not published online because of capacity constraints. So, um, so th that's helped a little. I think what you said is important. I mean, the student population is very tech savvy. So um, they certainly have interest. We aren't doing a lot right now because 93% of our riders, students, they're free. So we don't have uh, great fare boxes maybe that have the ability to track when people are riding, things like that. But they are definitely asking for more stuff, more things about how to know capacity. So we're experimenting with APCs. We don't have those on our buses so that people can do that. One of the things we did bring in when we did the system redesign is a kind of that flexible service route in one of our industrial areas. And then we have a late night service that's kind of operated like a door-to-door -door service. So I think there's opportunities to kind of use mobility on demand or something with those in the future. But I want to coordinate with our rural system before we do that, because they're currently using it for um, we contract out our paratransit to them. So they're using it for paratransit. They're using it for their services. So I think there's opportunities to um, connect them together. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Yeah. No, no, definitely. And I think that you, you raised a lot of issues there uh, that I, I think are, are important to kind of tease out a little bit. One, partnerships like with a rural agency, uh, you know, CTA, always glad to hear that. I, I, I probably know the agency. Has it heard of? Yeah, 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 yeah. that's okay. what I figured. Um, you know, one of the more prolific rural operators nationally uh, uh, and, and doing a lot of good work that way. But also the idea, I'm sure Ames has TNCs. Yeah. Um, Have you ever reached out to them? Is there any potential there or uh, do you view them as competition? How do you work within that realm? I'd like to give you a great answer on that one. I don't have a great answer. <laughs> I haven't reached out to them. Um, again, the students it, it were, so SciRide started in 81, and in 2001, the students voted on a referendum to make SciRide fair free. So they really, we are part of their culture. Right? They, don't, they don't even realize that we're not the, stu the um, university bus system. I mean, so they want SciRide all the time. We're actually an agency of the city. We get funding from the university, but we're not the university bus system. There isn't a university bus system. So they, they get confused. So they're not, um, they're not pushing for a lot of that, to be honest. That's interesting. I mean, uh, 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 in many ways, you know, I, having, having worked in transit for 30 years and worked with a lot of rural agencies, there's certain things that I've learned over the years to listen to when I'm riding along on a vehicle. Um, in rural agencies, I always want to hear the passenger say, this is my bus, that's my driver. And when I hear that, I know that what that, what that means is the system's really woven into the culture. And you're saying the same thing on a much larger scale, millions of, of rides mm -hmm. and, and thousands of passengers. But, it, but in many ways, what you're saying is the same thing. How about you, Sean, in terms of redesigns, you're obviously in the middle of that. Uh, tell us more about it. So, so our system was set up to provide more coverage of the community. So we have a lot of routes trying to cover a lot of land area. Um, 
you know, it's also built in the politics of the various uh, cities and townships that we surround that we have good coverage of all these areas. Right, we're, we're paying for this, so you better put a bus out here. Even if you only put it every 90 minutes and nobody rides, we want it. Right, yeah. so with greater coverage comes less frequency and uh, students want, they want their bus there every 10 or 15 minutes, not every half an hour like we do like we often provide on our up. So there, that's gonna be one of the areas that we're gonna face pressure moving forward. Uh, we've gone through a lot of changes organizationally in the past couple of years. So we've had to get through those uh, where we were a city department for uh, 40 years and became an independent transit authority in 2016. Uh, we expanded service to include Sundays and late night. So that had to happen. But kind of our next point is to do a comprehensive operational analysis and look at the overall system. And, you know, uh, a third of our routes kind of uh, radiate through the campus area. So that's going to be a key component, how we make that uh, run as efficiently as possible and provide as much service to the community as possible. How do you see deploying technology in, in that next step you're talking about? Because it's it's always there. Everybody everybody thinks it's it's just the magic bullet. You know, technology can do that, but but you know, it's not that easy. Uh, uh, but but how do you how do you look at technology and its role in taking you there? <laughs> yeah, we're people serving people, so that's the bottom line. Uh, but technology is a good tool. So we have, we have good software and have had it for a few years now. Avail. So we have good data on uh, passenger counts and where people are getting on the uh, buses, APCs. Uh, so we do have a lot of technology there. Uh, what we'd really like to improve on is our next technology is our fare system, okay. our fare structure and our fare collection hardware. Uh, it's constantly evolving, so we have to jump in at some point and get to the next generation of fare collection. Are you are you looking to go cashless or or start to at least introduce some of that? I'd like to in, uh, uh, do more of it. I don't see us going totally cashless. Uh, you know, just kind of due to our we don't want to lose clients and passengers because of that. No, no, definitely not. I mean, that's always the the trick is is people that are unbanked and otherwise we, we, we want to continue to serve them but make it as convenient as possible. Uh, uh, Taylor, you guys are, are kind of have a redesign forced on you whether you want it or not and, and, and now you've taken over these things. So what, do you, what are you thinking in terms of, of, of it's not, maybe it's not even a redesign, you're talking about a, a design uh, uh, to start off with. How are you approaching that? Yeah, so we're we're much like Sean in that our bus system covers a lot of area, but it's not very frequent, and it's been that way for a number of years. And it wasn't until the city was about to take over that it suddenly, uh, you know, residents and um, you know some of the elected officials realized that it's not that great of service. And um, July one, uh, we took it over last year, and then very quickly after that, uh, a, a county sales tax was going offline. So of course, there's an opportunity to um, increase funds for something, and the city council decided to put on the ballot to uh, put the put a transit vote up for a permanent sales tax to help fund the operation. So November 12th of last year, we had the first state, um, the first transit sales tax to pass in the state that was standalone. It wasn't a part of something else like maps in Oklahoma City or something like that. So we're very proud of that. And a part of that, we, we promised the citizens that we would look at our system and, and have somebody come help us uh, redesign it. And so that's, I kind of mentioned that earlier that we have a consultant coming in. Uh, we had a kickoff meeting uh, last or two Fridays ago, and it's probably not the best time with COVID uh, to go through and try to get public input and, and redesign a system and, uh, look at those things, but we uh, we're working off an old plan as it is a 2008 OU plan that has a lot of assumptions um, based on the university operating the whole thing. So we feel like we owe it to our passengers and our citizens to yeah. to do this. To look at it, and I will just briefly mention a part of that is uh, fare analysis. When the city took over, we uh, made the decision to be fare free. The university only collected cash and um, 
we just didn't want to hire the people and do the processes to do that. And we wanted to go through a temporary fair free period. And then it ended up being uh, more permanent just because the capital involved, as many of you know, to, to instigate something more than that. So let me, yeah. let me, let me ask a quick follow up. Uh, initially, you were mentioning that um, they tried the service. They didn't like it. What, what, what were their impressions at the, at the beginning of this that were negative on the service? Well, I think it was just uh, it was just somewhat pent up over the years. They they didn't realize it until transit became a conversation point when the university said that hey, we don't want to we don't want to do city service anymore, and then people started talking about it. I just I just feel like it wasn't talked about. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, uh, it's really easy to take a lot of things for granted when you don't when you know and and and. Bus service is certainly one of those things that um, uh, I, I, I remember working with an agency in Pennsylvania and they went through a, a, a complete service logo and color scheme makeover. Never changed anything else about their operation. And they immediately started getting calls about when did this new bus service start? <laughs> yeah. It, 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 can, it can go under the radar screen very easy. Uh, David, what are you thinking about redesigning? Uh, you know, how are you approaching some of those concepts? Well, about three years ago, we were unceremoniously uninvited from our downtown location. So we had to redesign our entire service. And um, in March, April this year, we were six months into a 12 month strategic plan with a very large consulting firm who at that point, I, I'm not sure they recovered yet. It's like, what do we do? We don't have our typical public input uh, kinds of questions to, to ask and how do we do this? We're looking at where we're looking at community growth or we were looking at community growth and where it would go. We were looking at um, our general location and whether or not that makes any sense to relocate a, a, hub, a hub back in the center of the urban area. And we were also looking at a micro transit component which is really what I've picked up on since COVID started, we were looking at rural areas. So instead of running a, a fixed route through that rural area with low frequency, we were looking at a micro transit solution uh, that really copied TNC. So we would put it out there, provide more frequency, more flexibility for the people in those rural areas to come in and transfer to a trunk line. Um, that same concept, once we hit the capacity line, that's what we started looking at for COVID. We would say, okay, we're gonna take this corridor, we're gonna service in this corridor that we've always called the red line route, only we're not gonna run a route. We're gonna have people make uh, appointments on their smart device. They're gonna know if they have a seat available at the time they wanna go. Um, but as we dug into that with all technology and especially with agencies our size, the size of ours, all of these universities, small urbans, Technology is difficult to implement. It takes time. It's expensive, relatively speaking. And um, we decided that in the middle of a pandemic and a study, oh, I forgot to mention, we had a, a excess property tax levy renewal, our first renewal uh, in the primary. So we were doing that at the same time too. And, and thankfully that was renewed. Um, yes. But we decided that trying to completely redesign the way we do transit uh, my staff had a conversation with me about that, I think. Um, but maybe we should put that off a little bit. So so we're, we're going to slow down on that piece of it and see where it goes. But we are looking at a lot of those same kinds of changes in the way we operate. It's not really the TNCs didn't want to partner with us. So, all right, well, let's do what they're doing, only maybe not lose as much money as they are doing it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is the trick. You know, everybody thinks that... Um, uh, still, I run into people all the time, if they're not in our business, they all operate under the assumption that like Uber and Lyft are, um, are, are uh, uh, highly profitable. And when you kind of give them an idea, uh, you know, that uh, there are no magic bean stocks and that it costs money to transport people no matter how you do it. And that in fact, they're not, you get it. Sometimes you get a, well, how are they doing that? And that's another whole session we could do on, on that one. But, but um, one other thing I wanted to touch on before we kind of start to get towards questions from the, from the audience is, 
And really, Taylor, I want to push to you is major capital projects. Uh, uh, you know, when we were talking, you mentioned that um, you guys are using CARES Act funds and, and in a major capital project. Can you tell us about that? And then the other panelists will kind of move down the line. Any, you know, uh, we talked about service designing and working with you, but, but infrastructure and pieces like that. What, what are you working on? And, and Taylor, why don't, you, why don't you lead off here? Yeah, uh, you used a good word a while ago, Scott, forced, but it's kind of it's kind of harsh. But there were a lot of things that the city had to start doing and had to think about um, when the, when they started operating a transit system. So uh, we're currently leasing space from OU out of the same building that they always ran the transit system out of because the city doesn't have a facility, an operations maintenance facility. So we started quickly uh, designing a, a facility on a piece of land that the city already owns near our current fleet maintenance operation and uh, quickly uh, found out we didn't have enough money for it or any money, some, if you want to really get technical. And so we uh, start in December, I just remember sitting around the table and everybody's just like, what are we going to do? And then January, February, uh, CARES Act money comes out and um, the, the city of Norman uh, quickly decided that they're going to use every cent to fund that operation maintenance facility. And so we viewed that as a, a critical need, a need that if we don't have, um, we're not going to be able to operate the facility or the transit system at all in an efficient way. And so we felt comfortable allocating those funds to the operations and maintenance facility. So um, we're probably one of the few exceptions, as we discussed the other day, of not using any of that money for operations yeah, yeah. and capital. And I actually got an email today that I might be able to submit that grant and get it actually obligated. <laughs> so it's been a it's been a lot working with FTA to get it finally obligated. But yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions on that if anybody's uh, curious about it. Kudos for getting it to that point. Uh, that that's exactly what you want where where you want to be right now. So uh, that that's good news. Uh, Barbara, anything in Ames and at SciRide in terms of capital stuff that you're working on? Um, probably our big capital project is we were fortunate to receive a LONO grant. So we're in the process of putting in um, two battery electric buses and the infrastructure for that. Um, so we partnered with um, CTE. So um, let's see, remember their name, Center for Transportation and the Environment on that project. So um, we've also been able to like creatively fund some of our projects. So we only get about three large buses a year. This year we were fortunate, we'll be getting six. So the two battery electric and Arctic and then three 40 foots, but we've been able to creatively fund them through Volkswagen settlement dollars. So that's been helpful for us. Excellent, excellent. It, it, do you have in the plans uh, to go all electric as you start to put in the infrastructure? What, what's your thinking there? Um, well, when CTE did it based on how our routes work, they never, we wouldn't be able to go 100% electric. They figured we typically on peak pullout pull out about 65 buses. They figured about a third of our fleet could be electric. Um, so beyond that, and then COVID happened. And so it kind of put some of those things on halt. So I think right now we're just going to see what the two look like, um, how it works for us, and then decide, you know, and obviously, you know, there's um legislation out there that you might not be able to get two buses at a time and stuff like that. So I'm not sure what will happen then. If you have to get five, that's a pretty big capital investment, you know? Yeah, it's, it, we're at that moment in the onboarding of battery electric buses for services your size, where we've got to be careful that bigger systems that are more well healed that want to go all in, don't lock us out from the a scalable approach that makes a lot more sense for us. Yeah, I think that's, that, that, that's a real issue. How about you, Sean, in terms of um, capital stuff? It, it's not quite as sexy as some of those other projects, but uh, very important, we're, we're looking at all our bus stops and shelters within the system. It, you know, there's 800 mark stops, uh, looking at stop spacing, ADA compliance, sidewalk connections, and methodically addressing all those issues to uh, make the pedestrian connections that are needed for a well-functioning no, uh, safe public transit system. It's critical. Uh, uh, you know, the, the stops, shelters are the image of our operations. And when those look old and shabby and tired because they are old and tired, um, people make assumptions about the operations, often that are incorrect, but 
you know, uh, uh, the, the, the majority of most of our community's interaction with public transit is seeing it from the, as they drive by in an automobile. And so I, I, I'm one who really believes very strongly in those optics being something to, to focus on. Yeah, even if it's not sexy, uh, <laughs> it's important. We do have sexy new signs though. There you go, there you go. Uh, well, um, we, we got another five minutes or so. Uh, any questions, comments, uh, issues that uh, from the audience that you'd like us to raise, if there is, uh, just drop in a uh, in the chat your name, and I'll call on you, and 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 we will we will cede the floor to you if you'd like that. I'll give you a second. See who's see who is uh, either a been paying attention or a, b is uh, is uh, uh, willing to to put themselves out. All right, David, go for it. Unmute yourself and and fire away. Sorry, terrific. Thank you. That was a that was a really informative conversation, everyone. So thanks for that. Um, my question is: I'm working with a number of universities now. Currently, um, actually, a technology vendor. Have you seen any interest from the universities in implementing digital displays at bus stops and on campus? Well, Sean's nodding, so we're going to turn that to you, Sean. First off. Yeah, our partner at the university, uh, th they had digital displays on their buses and we're working at getting them at their stops and shelters. Uh, they haven't pushed us yet in this speedy transition to incorporate that in our system, but I, I think they'd like to look at every revenue source that they have. Kind of an interesting model at university is they have partnership agreements with uh, Pepsi and Doritos and everything else. So it's it's all intertwined in this uh, uh, greater marketing uh, scheme that I don't quite understand, but uh, uh, our partner at the university does. Anybody else? All of our uh, bus stops and benches, or the majority of them are uh, advertising um, because the advertising company will pay for them and maintain them. Uh, so uh, they're really interested in doing digital display, but uh, We've been talking about that. When I was with the university running the transit system. Uh, we've been talking about that for five years. And just the issue with, uh, you know, traffic, cars uh, get distracted or it's too bright. Uh, people just don't want to open up that can of worms around here, I don't think. But we've been talking about it. So. Anyone else? All right, well, we have another question. Kate Morley, uh, the floor is yours. Fire, uh, unmute yourself and fire away. Thank you, David. Thanks. My question is for David. Um, I'm really impressed by the numbers you quoted that the student housing projects are contributing towards the service. Is that because you extended a line just for them, or did you get them to actually buy into routes you were already running? So it's been both at different times. Uh, initially, a couple of the housing complexes built near our line, so we would divert basically into a parking lot to pick them up. The one that's been our longest uh, successful contract, we actually made them the end of the line for the service, but it was an area that we had no service in at all. So it was a, it was a mutual benefit and they were a larger uh, national company and they understood the value of public transit. They also understood that they were not good at doing public transit. Usually what would happen with housing complexes is we would go in and we would operate the system for a year or two. They would see it and they'd say, oh, well, we can do that. And then they would call us about three or four months in when their one bus broke down and they're like, uh, can you cover for us? And like, no, I'm sorry, that's not the way this works. So I think it's careful, you have to be careful about how you start the relationship and create what the expectations that you create with those private partners. And you have to be very reliable and very dependable for them so that that's one part of their operation they don't even have to think about. They know what a but they know it's a budget number and they know it's going to be there. And Kate, we heard a lot of the similar last year when we held this conference in person in Athens, Georgia. Uh, we actually did a lot of discussion exactly on that topic. Um, 
because you're right, the gold standard is getting someone else to help contribute to and support service you're already providing. Uh, but as David mentions, being able to use that kind of relationship to also launch new services and make them cost effective is, it, it, it truly is win-win. Anybody else want to uh, address the, the question, even though it was directed to David uh, in your areas? Um, the only thing I'd say is we've done it, and so I'll be curious, um, but we've done it before, but what happened in our case was they sold the apartment complex, and so then now you no longer have service to that area. So then you have people upset because they had service, and now that service is now gone. So that's why we haven't done it lately as kind of a practice. It's just a caution. I think it's a great revenue source. I think if you can get collaboration, private, public sector stuff like that, that's awesome. It's just one of the hurdles we faced with it, I guess. Yeah, no, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Um, well, we are, we are reaching the end. It's 3.45 and I, I actually 3.46, I've run long. Um, but uh, thanks to Barbara, Sean, Taylor, and David. Uh, uh, I think it was a really informative session and I really appreciate you giving us your time and, and energy today. Uh, for everybody, at four o'clock, we, we usually have a tour as part of SUN. Uh, the host agency will take us around and show us what they do. Well, you don't want a tour of my house, I can assure you. Um, we're gonna have a tour instead of St. Cloud, Minnesota, St. Cloud Metro's Mobility Training Center, which is an innovative facility that they've built that it does ADA designations, uh, travel training. Um, it's really a really cool facility. I watched the video they put together yesterday. We'll have some people on hand from St. Cloud to answer questions. That starts at four o'clock and the link to that you can see in the chat box, the virtual system tour. And then I would also urge you to uh, join us again in the morning tomorrow. We're gonna try to make sense out of Washington, DC, which is always difficult, but I promise you, we will do it. Um, we're gonna talk about reauthorization, appropriations, CARES Act 2.0. We've got three of the leads at FTA, uh, that including the executive director at the Federal Transit Administration, they're going to directly open themselves up to questions um, and talk about their implementation of the CARES Act and a lot of other things. So we have some really good sessions set for tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate your time today. Be well, and I look forward to seeing you in the morning and enjoy the tour. I know I'm going to, I'm going to be on it as well. And thanks to everybody. Uh, thanks to our presenters again. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.